Medical towers and salk give us the, pretty much the basic issues in con. And let's see how we play some of these out. Now, we're going to look at two major projects, DACA and Exeter. But first, we'll look at some other projects. So one of them is, hang on, uh, City Tower. Khan did this with a woman named Ann Ting, who was his girlfriend for a while because he had a daughter, Alexandra Ting, and she wrote a book on Khan. Ann Ting is sort of a geometry freak. She's in the community of people that include Horesh Lavani, who has all that stuff in the cabinets downstairs near the, in the basement, and all those, all those ge geometry things. So here they're exploring an office tower using the rigidity of triangularization. Kind of an awkward building, but interesting idea. Uh, Khan does a series of houses. This one was not built, and I'm just not into the houses. So there's a whole book on the houses. Uh, hopefully it's in the library, I don't know. But if you're into it, you can get that book. But this one was an, an interesting project, and the uh, Goldenberg House never got built. But it's very Khan in its organization. <clears throat> now, it also introduced into architecture the 45 degree angle. Nobody was making angles. Uh, and uh, so this was uh, an introduction. But the key thing here is look at how there are these zones. So we have the uh, courtyard, and then we have circulation, <clears throat> then we have servant spaces. Then we have served spaces. So these are the living spaces. And these are bathrooms, closets, kitchens, etc. So there's kind of a progressive geometric organization that gives a place for each of these. So now if you say, well, I want another bathroom. Well, we know where it goes. It goes in this zone. You don't stick it over here or something like that. This is First Unitarian Church of Rochester. It's a somewhat important building. I'm not uh, that into it. But a couple of fun ideas here. One is he starts, well, next week we'll get into Kant's philosophy, but we can start here, and he says, in doing a church, first you have the sanctuary. The sanctuary are for those who would kneel. And then there's an ambulatory for those who would be near. And then there is a wall, and those who walk past the wall just wink. There's a church diagonally across the street here. I've been here a few decades, I've never been in there. But you know it's there. You know, it's like if you need it, if uh, you know it represents a certain spiritual interest in the culture, which is communicated to us who don't use it by the wall. So it, the wall has that job, and then the sanctuary has the job of being the place for the people who go there on Sunday. Um, in this case, he also had a school. So he starts by saying, okay, we've got uh, the sanctuary, the ambulatory, the school, the, the corridor, and then the school. And then he, so that's his form diagram, the underlying conceptual order, form and design. Form is the underlying conceptual order, Design is the particular way you carry it out. <clears throat> he then does his first design. And it's a very direct translation of the form. So here's the sanctuary, the ambulatory, the corridor, the school. And he says, maybe the school shouldn't be strung out like that. Maybe it should be its own thing. 
And he says, well, you know, the bathrooms are needed over at the sanctuary. The deacon's office is needed, should be over there. And all the pieces run back. They want to be here. And then that gives us our final design. So we've gone through a couple of iterations to arrive at our final design, starting with form and ending up with design. So I'll talk about that more next week, but this is our first introduction to Kahn's, this aspect of Kahn's design method. This is a map of Rome that Kahn had on his wall. Uh, the school, the dean had an original. It's Piranesi. So this is Robert Adams' imaginary map plan of Rome, and Piranesi made the print. But we find on here, if we zoom in, which I can't do, um, lots of Kahn's buildings and lots of other buildings. Uh, it's a real gold mine for architects. Now, <clears throat> Kahn also had plans of Scottish castles. And the walls of the Scottish castles were so thick, you could put rooms in the, inside the thickness of the walls. And that inspires him for a dorm he does for Bryn Mawr. Oh, during our break, let's talk more about monumentality. Some people raised that question last week. So this is Bryn Mawr dorm, and we see what we saw in the Goldenberg house. There's a courtyard, a group space, then there are servant spaces, closets, toilets, etc. then a corridor, then the inner part of the room is entrance and closet, and then the outer part of the room. The building is poured in place concrete, and then, oh, here we go. Here's a better image. Here you can see how the windows are working. So this room has a window here, and then I got this one wrong. The window's right there and right there. And then uh, the two people occupy this room, and you have your desk here. There's a desk on either one of these bumps. Then we see the stairs, toilets, etc. In this band, this is the commons room. One of them's a dining room, one of them's an entrance, and one of them's a, just a gathering room, like a big living room. But you see a real uh, delight with the geometry here. And here's some of the geometric explorations they did before arriving at the final. And here he does something Frank Lloyd Wright wouldn't do. This is slate, like blackboard. Anybody know what Frank Lloyd Wright wouldn't do? Okay, the way slate works is it's very layered. And you can split it into thin pieces and you make blackboards. Now that's a fake one, but upstairs in some of the rooms have real slate blackboards and they're much better than, than the fake ones. Um, but the slate forms this way over millions of years as sediment settles and compresses. Franklin Wright says, we should put our stone in the building in the configuration that nature built it. And he objects to then tilting it up like that. But it's a really great material. It's very durable. And it has a nice effect of modern architects like. Then he leaves a lot of exposed concrete in these um, spaces. Now you might wonder, is this, do you want all this raw concrete in a dorm? And my thinking is, it's kind of cool because 
uh, it's now mixed, but this was a girl's school. But it's like, this is the years that you spend in a sweatshirt <laughs> when you're up all night studying and whatever. And uh, so the, the kind of rough uh, quality of the finish goes along with that. Okay, this is a building that's much admired in India. I, I'm not going to spend any time on it. I'm not really that familiar with it. Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. So Khan was doing Indian Institute of Management and Dhaka, which is the capital of Bangladesh, at the same time. And that's what killed him. <laughs> he was flying back and forth to India and running up his American Express card, and neither client was paying him. And um, so he had crushing debts, these, you know, 20 hour flights. Finally got a heart attack. But it's a real celebration of brick. There's uh, earthquakes here. So this is sort of like a 360 degree arch. Not only is there an arch here, the arch goes all the way around because there can be forces from any direction in an earthquake. Okay, and now Dhaka. So, Cherry, Bangalore, or Dhaka, it's sometimes spelled, Dhaka is spelled different ways. 1947, England grants India independence. India had been a colony of Great Britain, part of the British Empire. India had been struggling for independence for a long time, and the era of colonies was ending, and Britain needed India's support in World War II. So the deal was, you support us, we'll give you independence after the war. 1947, independence is granted. And the northern part of India was mostly Muslim, the southern part mostly Hindu and the Muslims and the Hindus decided they couldn't get along and they needed separate countries. So the Muslim country is Pakistan and the Indian country, the Hindu country is India. Now, the way it worked out, Pakistan was in two parts, not two separated parts, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. East Pakistan felt it was being mistreated. It was decided to give them a new capital to make them feel better. In the middle of that construction, they, East Pakistan decided they were going to secede and become their own country. There was a war. India intervened on the side of East Pakistan, and it became independent, and that's Bangladesh. What was started then became the capital of Bangladesh. Khan does, uh, now, it wouldn't happen today, but uh, this Muslim country got a Jewish architect to do their capital. So that was a different era. So the point we want to make here, and there are lots of these studies, is that There are two approaches to city planning. There's, well, there's two philosophies, being and becoming. And we'll talk about that when we talk about comparing kind of Venturi. Khan is into being, Venturi is into becoming. So being says there are absolute entities. Things exist. Becoming says there are only processes. Is there a me or am I a process? 
I'm always growing, aging, eating, uh, changing. There's no frozen me. There's a philosopher named Henri Bergson who makes a philosopher out of a philosophy out of that philosophy of change, philosophy of becoming. That change is the fundamental foundational reality. Change isn't something that happens to stuff. Change is the stuff. Now, we're going to see next week when we go into Kant's philosophy, he's very much of the being type. He says, what does the school want to be? There is an ideal school out there. It is crystal clear, and it wants to come into manifestation. It doesn't necessarily have a form yet, but it has an essential identity. In designing a city, you, most modern city planners would say, let's say you're doing a city from scratch, like Dhaka or Brasilia, famously done by Niemeyer in Brazil, or Chandigarh by Corbu. Planners would say today, it's a process. What's going to be there? For? What's the absolute first thing that's going to happen? Worker housing, <laughs> the people who are going to build it. <laughs> the first thing you got to build is the place where the people are going to live. We're going to do the building. Then you add this, and then you add that. Now, you might be able to just barely see here. Uh, let's say here are two boulevards. A modern city planning would say, those are not going to be the same because you build this one, it's being built in an empty environment. You go to build this one, it's being built in an environment where this one exists. So it's being built in a different world. And so a, a modern city planner would see everything as, and the city's never finished. When are they going to finish New York? <laughs> You know, New York will be great when they finish it. <laughs> well, been waiting 300 years. So <laughs> it isn't going to happen. It's a process. Now, what you want to do, therefore, is rather than say, this is going to look great when it's done, what you do is you say, let's make it so that when building's going on, things function well. You know, to say, well, we've got to close half the street because a new building's going on. Well, there's always going to be a new building going up. Let's lay out our city in such a way that it will accommodate that. Kant's attitude is it has to all be done at once. Because if he envisions uh, each of the institutions has a meaning. So, for example, tells the story that he goes to the chief judge of the Supreme Court and he says, let me show you the drawings I have for the new Supreme Court. And the chief judge says, I don't even want to see them. I don't want to go to the new city. That's where the legislature is. The court is eternal. We say, what are basic principles? The legislature is re-elected every two years. They say, what do I, you know, what do I need to do to get re-elected? Not what's right. What do I need to do to get re-elected? What corrupt thing do I have to do to get a swimming pool for my district so I'll get re-elected? Supreme Court justice says, what does the Constitution say? What are the fundamental principles? Doesn't mean they can't be corrupt, but, uh, but philosophically, these are very different. And he says, I don't want to be near them. So Kant thinks about it, he comes back, he says, got a great idea. I'm going to put the mosque in between the Supreme Court and the legislature. Chief Judge says, I love it. 
is what the institution of religion will mediate between these two. Now, it didn't happen. But that's the kind of thinking Kant has. So one of the things he has here is a sports stadium. I mentioned that before. Uh, body, mind, soul. The body is the, the uh, mind is a legislature. The soul is the mosque. The body is the sports stadium. And he says, you can't make it in pieces. It's like you're going to make half a person and, 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 and add the left arm later. You need, it's a, it's a unity. It's a totality. <laughs> well, practically, you're not going to be able to do it. But that's the thinking, and I think there's a validity to that kind of thinking. So hopefully I've got these drawings later, but we'll see. So the key building is the assembly building. And goes through a lot of iterations. And he's got these great forms on the roof. And we have this little bit gross term. We call them light sucks. So you want to, here's the uh, legislature, you know, the Congress, and the light comes in and bounces and comes down, comes through these big holes and comes down. <clears throat> now, here is the assembly, all the seats, and then we've got these corridors, and then we've got the support offices. Here is a monumental stair for a parade ground and all that. And this is slightly off kilter. What does that tell you? And something's pointed a little bit. It's the mosque. So this is set up oriented for whatever. And then when you get to the mosque, it's got a point toward Mecca. Now, look at how he handles these, this rotational notion. It's like it's rotated a little bit. It's like these are ball bearings, right? That they can, this can turn on this. That's how he handles that geometric issue. So there's a nice story about this where a client says, we need um, 4,000 square feet of closets at the entrance. And Khan says, what the hell's that for? He said, prayer rugs for Muslims. We have to pray five times a day. So pretty much every time we go in or out of the building, we have to pray. And Khan says, you're telling me every time you go in or out, you pray? And he says, yeah. He says, that means the entrance is a mosque. We'll make it 40,000 square feet. So that's how that got to be a mosque. Question. Yeah. So they enter from the mosque? I guess so. Uh, anybody been there? I haven't been there. You think it would be too disruptive to the religious service? Yeah, because like how, like, is there a side entrance or something? Because, like, I don't know, but maybe you enter here and the prayer is taking off in, in these corners. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, the whole complex is done with water. It's a rice culture, so everything's flooded to make rice patties. So the capital celebrates that. They also have big problems. Three quarters of the country is underwater during flooding season is not good. It's poured in place concrete with this white marble to offset the layers. So the, he knew the concrete was going to be very messy <coughs> and the white bands of marble give a crispness. This is also an entrance with a great stair.
So this is the mask side. And these are some of the spaces since like Khan died long before it was finished. And I don't, um, I'm doing another book on Khan right now. And I do five buildings and this is not one of them. Uh, a, I haven't been there. But B, I don't think he really worked it out. I think, you know, they just sort of finished it. They threw, like, just, they just threw glass in these big openings. He really hadn't thought through how that should be done. Now, he envisioned these uh, huge beams up here spanning across. And these would make these They would reflect the light inside. We'll see an example where he does that. And when they got to that point, they discovered the footings were totally inadequate to handle the weight of that. And Khan had long since died, but his engineer on many of his projects, August Commandant, developed this very lightweight shell vaulting uh, to cover the um, central space. <clears throat> uh, Commandant was very happy with it. Uh, most of the Khan people I know don't think Khan would have been happy with it. But I don't know if there was a better solution given the problem. So one of the things that Khan does is reintroduce the centers of buildings. Uh, when we talk, we'll talk about Corbu's five points toward a new architecture. And modern architecture wanted to eliminate the center of the building because the center of the building is privileged. That's where the king is. And we want a democratic society with no center so that every, nobody's superior to anybody else. And Khan reintroduces these centers. We'll talk about what he's doing philosophically. Ah, here we go. So these are the giant beams that he envisioned spanning across, and there just wasn't the um, ability to do that. 